I've got 6.30. We'll call to order the March 20th, 2023 Planning and Zoning Board for the City of Tarpon Springs. Uh, Mr. Kouskoutis has, has offered to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So let's stand and face the flag, please. Uh, the purpose mission, I think we'll skip tonight also. Uh, so uh, we'll call the meeting to order and have a roll call, please. Mr. Seaman? Here. Mr. Kuskudis? Here. Ms. Frontis? Here. Mr. Rockland? Here. Ms. Early? All right, and we have a few changes to the agenda this evening. Uh, application 22-93 and 22-94, uh, ordinance 2023-12, a conditional use approval and a site plan approval for property at 1372 North Pinellas Avenue has been deferred to a date certain of April 17th. And application 22-143, Ordinance 2023-06, a rezoning for property at North Highland, uh, 1,200 feet northeast of the intersection of North Highland and Keystone, is deferred to a date to be re-advertised. Uh, in addition to that, our attorney has handed out some information on sunshine laws and ethics that she wants to speak with us for just a few minutes on at the end of the meeting since it's going to be a, a relatively shorter meeting tonight. Uh, item five on our agenda is approval of the minutes for June 20th and January 23rd. I think we need to approve approve those individually, correct? Or together? You can do them both together them unless together. you had changes. Okay. Uh, is, do I have a, a motion? I would make that motion, Mr. Chairman. It's for both, for both. For both to be approved. I'll second. Can we have a roll call, please? Miss Early? Yes. Mr. Rocklin? Yes. Miss Frontis? Yes. Mr. Kuskudis? Yes. And Mr. Seaman? Yes. That brings us to application 22 141, a request to rehear future land use map amendment. And to, I'm sure the staff will fill us in more, but to be clear, I understand this tonight is only a request to determine whether we will rehear this item. If we choose to rehear it, it would actually be reheard at the April meeting. So, so this is not redoing the item. It's, it's just to determine whether we feel there are grounds to rehear it. And if with that, will the staff give their report. Uh, yeah, you're correct. Um, so uh, some of you may recall that last month at the February hearing, we <coughs> ha heard this application number 22-141. It was for the Moses Tucker Partners application for a future land use map amendment. Uh, this property was located at 44098 US Highway 19 North. Um, they were requesting a future land use change from the ROR, which is the residential office retail land use category, to the CG commercial general category. Um, at the meeting, the board did uh, vote with a vote of three to two to recommend denial of the application to the board of commissioners. Um, following that hearing, uh, staff did realize that some of the information uh, regarding the current land use category of ROR was incorrect in the staff report in the presentation. The information that was cited in the presentation in the report was actually the standards of the residential office general category, um, rather than the ROR category that's actually the land use of the property. Uh, this resulted in some incorrect use and density and intensity allowances being presented uh, for your con consideration of the application. Um, at this time, the applicant is requesting the Planning and Zoning Board to rehear the application at the April 17th meeting. Uh, with an updated staff report and presentation that would reflect the correct information. Um, 
the application would have to be re-noticed, so we would send out new public notice um, to the surrounding property owners, and then um, the applicant does understand that a rehearing may or may not yield a different decision by the board. Um, one thing to, to note is that in the event that you all choose not to rehear the application, it will still move forward to the Board of Commissioners, um, but what we would do is we would update the staff report to have the correct information, make them aware of the error, and let them know that um, they came back to the board requesting a rehearing and what your decision was. Um, so the application will still move forward, but they would like the opportunity to come back before you guys with some correct information. Um, so with that, I can answer any questions. Um, and what we're looking for tonight is just a motion and a vote as to whether or not to rehear the application. I, I, do, ha I do have a question. Sure. Um, so if the densities are, in, are different <coughs> from the ROR, um, to the, what did you say, there were two RO, different categories of the ROR. Mm -hmm. How is that different from the CG that they're requesting? Right, okay, so the CG category, um, what they're requesting, that information was correct. So everything that was presented in the report reflecting the CG category, the allowed uses, the density, intensity, FA, the floor area ratio was correctly portrayed. Um, the difference was really between the existing land use category. So. Um, with back up to the memo that was provided in your packet, I put the information from the comprehensive plan for both of those categories so you could see the difference. But just for, you know, kind of to generally go over it, the residential office general category, which was the incorrect one, would allow for um, 15 dwelling units per acre, and it allows a floor area ratio of 0 .40. The ROR category, which is the correct land use category and how it is currently um, designated, allows for um, the same 15 dwelling units per acre, um, but it has a lower floor area ratio of 0 0.20. Um, another difference is really the permitted or the primary uses allowed. The um, ROG category really limited it to the residential and office uses, whereas the ROR category had a little more um, use allowances and had included some personal services, I believe, in retail uses. So, so, mm -hmm. so regardless of what it was, ROR general versus ROR retail, that's actually irrelevant to to the point of they're requesting a completely different category. It just had different consideration for the board as to what they're currently allowed to have on the property <clears throat> as opposed to what they were requesting. Okay. Um, so there may have been some, you know, like I said, the ROG category, which was incorrect in the report, said they really were only allowed to have office and residential. So when you're going to the CG category, it potentially allowed a larger array of uses whereas it actually did allow for some retail uses in their current designation that wasn't reflected to you all as a board mm -hmm. for consideration. But no, it's not changing the request at all, it's just having correct information. I have a question mm -hmm. um, for the attorney. What are the requirements that we're supposed to consider for a request for rehearing? So you technically actually don't have anything in your rules that provides for you all to have a rehearing, so it is largely in your discretion. Um, what I looked at in helping staff kind of determine how to present this was what the criteria is for actually what the rehearing is before the Board of Commissioners. Part of the reason you all don't have a mechanism for rehearing is because you make a recommendation and you're not a final decision-making body. The final decision-making a body for them to appeal from is actually the Board of Commissioners. And I, that's what I assume because we were advisory, because um, it sounds like the, the decision was based off of not necessarily the allowances that they already had. I mean, in this case, most of the, I think, my reasoning for the no was that the allowances were enough and that the code was that way for a reason, as Mr. Vesey explained. So, I mean, if this, if the original, the correct one actually already allowed more uses than I think that we, form, that we normally had, but um, I do want to know who recognized the mistake. Staff did <laughs> the next morning. I just, it kind of occurred to me, I was sitting thinking about what um, was presented and I was going back and forth and I was like, I don't know if that was correct. So I double checked um, the comp plan and it was just, it was just 
miscited in the staff report. Um, so we contacted the applicant, made them aware. Um, the email that was also attached in the backup material for tonight's packet um, kind of outlined their options, and they could have gone just to the board with okay. updated information, um, but they're aware that the uh, Board of Commissioners doesn't prefer to have new information that you all did not have the opportunity to consider, um, so they chose to ask if you would rehear the application. I, I just have a, a comment in regards, uh, and thank you, uh, Ali and staff, for uh, the transparency and the honesty and, and bringing this forward. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that it may have been a little more food for thought for discussion amongst us and Q&A with the applicant uh, as far as what their options would have been that we may have found palatable or, or not. Uh, I don't know if a rehearing is going to change that at all. And like you said, the final determination can be made to the board. I was hoping there was maybe an opportunity for compromise uh, between the two lots that were separated by the easement for Duke uh, because you have residential impact on one side and basically non-residential on the other side. And I thought maybe uh, a dialogue could be established to kind of segregate those lots for one to be a little looser with what they can put there and one a little tighter. And that was something that was mentioned to them uh, on the record that evening uh, about what could be possibly restricted on the southern portion that abuts the residential lot. So th those are just my thoughts in regards. I, I, I think I, was, I actually was in favor of the applicant, but I don't, I don't know if this exercise would change a vote uh, of, of this board. And I mean, if I thought that it might, I, I'd probably be inclined to, to have a hit rehearing. But, but, but uh, um, you know, um, I, I don't know if that would change the direction of the vote of this board. Because, you know, I think lo looking at what they're trying to do is expand the uses of, uh, and, and I think that was part of the concern of some of the board members and, and you know, unless somebody's saying, "Look, I, I'd like to rehear it because I think there's an opportunity," I, 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 I just think we're just wasting our time. I would agree. Yeah, I, I tend to think it's probably unlikely that it's going to change anything, but I don't. I'm not necessarily against doing it if if. Uh, you know, our attorney feels like it's the way we should go. Ultimately, it is discretionary um, because it, the decision you made was based on incorrect information. Um, and you should really want to make sure that you are getting the correct information in all your applications, whether it's from staff or whether it's from an applicant. Mm -hmm. um, that's just imperative to the decision making process. I, I thought the information was correct as to what they were going to, what they were requesting as far as the uh, the change it was what right. the current use is right. which was different <laughs> right so the, so the current use gives them what actually gives them a little bit more expansion of the uses as opposed to what they're looking for so so I don't know how it, a mistake would have been in the in the presentation for for changing it to what the applicant was seeking well when you look at the intensity of the uses that are allowed um, under uh, the ROR, R -R -R, yeah, versus um, the the other one, mm -hmm. the one that it actually has it allows much more intensive uses already. Mm -hmm. So you're not changing that much with respect to compatibility to surrounding mm -hmm. properties because there already is that sort of gamut of uses that's available right there next to the the residential. Mm -hmm. So that that's the only thing that. I could say that would really impact the decision on on that change and maybe this is a question for staff how does that overlay with our comprehensive land use that we've been looking at mm -hmm. well so these are the land use categories so as we kind of talked about in that application so you have two layers we have your, your future land use and then you have your zoning um, the future land use is what they're looking at changing. So the land use category that we described in the staff report and in the presentation was reflecting a land use category that actually allows um, a much narrower amount of land uses. It really restricted it more so to the um, office use and residential use, um, which I think went into a lot of the considerations, potentially went into a lot of considerations. 
the actual designation of that property is ROR, residential office retail, which has a slightly more expanded use. Yes, the CG category does allow more than that, but there was a different um, you know, allowance that they have today. So that's why we felt that it was important to kind of make the applicant aware of the um, error as well as give them the option if they wanted to um, have an opportunity to go before you guys again. Any further questions for staff? Just, just as a quick uh, confirmation follow-up. So any new information that the applicant decides, uh, including what transpired with the, uh, with the hearing here, that can be presented to the Board of Commissioners and they would be fully aware and could base their decision on that. Yes, exactly. Ultimately, there's no wrong decision here because <laughs> the correct information is going to go up to the Board regardless. Thank you. Yeah, and just to follow up with that, um, you know, if you choose or vote not to have a rehearing with this board, we will still also let them know that we made you aware of the mistake, you considered your options, and made your decision. So they would have the full uh, information. I, I think at the end of the day, it's going to fall into the commission anyways. Right. So, <laughs> the, uh, only one comment I would make about that, though, is that in in some past instances, we have not been pleased and it's it's been uh, the the commission has made a very major effort in more recent things to to make sure that if there was any changed equipment or not equipment information that we did rehear the question right. and hear all of that information so I'm not sure but perhaps not rehearing it would sort of uh, be going against what we've been asking the, the BOC to do. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I would agree with you normally, but in this circumstance, the request that they are making is something that was presented correctly. And we turned down that expansion under the new, if, uh, under the new uh, uh, zone or land use that they wanted to add. The mistake was not that. The mistake was that the existing land use um, was a little bit broader than the city presented, yeah. but it has nothing to do with the change that they're requesting. And that's why, you know, if it was a completely different understanding of what the requested change would be, I would agree 100% with you. Mm -hmm. Well, and obviously, as the attorney explained, it's discretionary, but ultimately our decision of course is only advisory so they still have a recourse with the board of commissioners but it does seem like they're getting almost another try in terms that judges tell us another bite at the apple that um, because the fault is not on them and it's on the staff and not pointing fingers but I would like to know what has been put in place so that mistakes like this don't happen again well, <laughs> yeah, this was this was merely just an unintentional mistake. It was just looking at the code. Well, I mean, like a review right. process. Right. It was just I was just someone check your work. Or correct. So, yeah. You know. So we we do do um, you know we write reports. Others in the office review them, and this was just it was just something that we missed. So we we'll, we definitely try and pay attention as much as we possibly can, and especially with this particular thing that's now on my radar <laughs> again. So yes, we will be double checking everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just have one, one last question, unfortunately, for counsel again. If by chance uh, we, we vote not to rehear and our, our prior <coughs> ruling stands, and then the Board of Commissioners also votes it down, mm -hmm. would the applicant then have any grounds for some further appeal based on the fact that we did not rehear or did, were not presented with the factual information at the time of that hearing? Right. So the the rules for rehearing before the board of commissioners are very specific and that's part of the reason why we presented it was in line with those rules because mm -hmm. it specifically says if there's like a mistake of fact that that is a grounds for rehearing mm -hmm. right um, but then uh, even if the correct information is presented to the board um, they their right of appeal then is to the circuit court they have 30 right. days from the day that that decision is rendered mm -hmm. to appeal that decision to the circuit court as basically as a final administrative action right. Right. Thank you. Any further questions for staff? Seeing none, is the applicant present and would they like to make a presentation or speak? You can go right to that one. 
Yep. And state your name and address. And Amy Huber, 745 Virginia Street, Dunedin, Florida. Thank you for your time tonight. As Allie mentioned, she reached out to us. The reason I would ask you, and I'm not trying to waste anybody's time, I don't necessarily disagree with anything that any of you have said tonight. However, I would hate to get to the Board of County Commission or the Board of Commissioners only to have them send it back to you because they want you to hear it this way. Mm -hmm. So I would respectfully ask you to please rehear this application, not for another bite at the apple, but solely that we have a clear record that goes to the commission so that we don't end up back before you regardless. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have questions for the applicant? Seeing none, are there any members of the public here wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, I need a motion and a second and then we can discuss further. I'd like to make a motion. I don't know how to word it. <laughs> for this, just a motion to rehear. Motion, motion to rehear. Motion to rehear. Okay. okay. I would second that. Is there any further board discussion? Can we have a roll call, please? Miss Early? As to rehearing? Mm -hmm. To rehear it. The motion is to rehear the application at your next meeting. No. Mr. Rocklin? No. Ms. Frontis? Yes. Mr. Kuskusa? Mr. Kuskutis? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just. <laughs> he was oh. waiting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say yes just for the sake of what, what the chairman had said. Uh, I may disagree with him, but I think what he said has merit. Hmm. So I will say yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right. That brings us to item number seven, the quasi-judicial announcement and swearing of speakers. Good evening. The matters before the City of Tarpon Springs <coughs> Planning and Zoning Board are quasi-judicial in nature. In a quasi-judicial proceeding, the Board's function is to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances. This is a legal decision regarding the application before the Board. The Board may only consider evidence that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues arising from the application and the applicable code sections. Any and all persons testifying at this hearing are required to do so under oath. All persons testifying at this hearing must give their name, address, and must indicate whether or not they have been sworn for the record prior to proceeding with their testimony. All testimony and questioning at this hearing must address the matters that are relevant and material to the issues under cons consideration based on the established criteria. If any board member has disclosures regarding an application, please make your disclosures on the record at the beginning of the hearing. That would include any ex parte communications or any declaration of voting conflicts of interest. If there is not a full board present at the beginning of the hearing, the applicant may request a continuation to the next regularly scheduled meeting of the, of the Planning and Zoning Board for the City of Tarpon Springs. And for the applicant's information, there is not a full board here tonight. So that is that will be in your discretion. The following is the established procedure which will be followed at this hearing. First, city staff will present its testimony and, and evidence regarding the application. And then the applicant has the opportunity to, to ask questions and cross-examine staff. The applicant then has the opportunity to present its witnesses and evidence, and the city has the opportunity to cross-examine the applicant and the applicant's witnesses. Then members of the public opposing or in support of the application will be given the opportunity to speak. The time limits are four minutes for each individual. The applicant um, and then the city may then present any rebuttal testimony and evidence in a closing statement for summary. Then the board will close the public hearing for discussion and consideration of the application. So at this time, anyone who will be speaking, please stand to receive the oath. Go ahead and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth on the matters before the City of Tarpon Springs Planning and Zoning Board this evening? Yes, I do. All right, thank you. All right, that brings us to item number eight, application 22-85, 
Resolution 2023-13, a site plan approval for the property at 4390 U.S. Highway 19 North. Can we have the staff presentation, please? Uh, sure. Allie Keene, Senior <coughs> Planner with the Planning and Zoning Department. Um, this is under resolution number 2023-13, and I'll just recite the uh, resolution title. It is, this is a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application number 22-85, requesting site plan approval to construct a 2,618 square foot drive through coffee shop, Black Rifle Coffee, on 0.82 acres, more or less, located at 40390 U.S. Highway 19 North in the HB Highway Business Zoning District, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. Again, this is um, an application for site plan approval for the Black Rifle Coffee Project. Um, again, resolution number 2023-13. Uh, the property is approximately 0.82 acres in size. Uh, the current land use designation is CG Commercial General, and the current zoning designation is HB Highway Business. Uh, the applicants are proposing to construct a drive-through coffee shop um, on the property. This is a permitted use by right in the Highway Business Zoning District. The site plan includes a drive-through lane that would accommodate up to 11 stacking spaces. Um, it has a small outdoor seating area, a on-site parking lot with 39 spaces, which does comply with the land development code requirements for this proposed use and the size of the proposed use. Um, they have provided a landscaping plan that does meet and exceed in some aspects the land development code requirements for landscaping. And they're also proposing some pedestrian connections to the existing sidewalk along uh, US-19 into adjacent properties, which I'll touch on here in a moment. Um, again, the property is located off of US Highway 19. It's outlined in yellow here on the screen. All properties on both sides of US-19 are in the HB Highway Business Zoning District. Um, there is a property to the west of the site, which is in the MHP, or the Mobile Home Park Zoning District, and that is the existing Tarpon Shores Mobile Home Park. Uh, to the south of the site is the existing Tarpon Shores Inn, uh, to the north is BBT Auto, and then across US-19, there's a mixture of retail and warehouse uses. uses. This is a look at the proposed site plan. I've highlighted the building location in blue, just so it's easier to see here on the screen. Um, they are proposing a single access point to US-19 um, on the north side of the property. It is a right in, right out only site. There's an existing, or drive access, there's an existing uh, median in US-19 that prevents any sort of left-hand turn movements from this property. Uh, the drive-through lane is located along the back of the property to accommodate, in this case, they're showing 11 stacking spaces, but it does have potential to accommodate additional spaces if necessary. The building is approximately 2,600 square feet in size. They are proposing a small outdoor eating area here the outdoor eating area was also or calculated in the parking calculation, and again, they're providing 39 on-site spaces, and I believe that they are required 38 spaces. Uh, they are also, it's a little hard to see, but they're proposing some pedestrian connections, um, shaded here in very light orange, to the existing US-19 sidewalk. They're providing a um, ADA accessible crossing and connection to the site. They're also proposing to have um, potential connections to adjacent properties, the Tarpon Shores um, hotel to the south, and then potentially the mobile home park to the west of the site um, to potentially provide opportunities for residents of the mobile home park and visitors and um, to the hotel to be able to go to the site without getting into a vehicle to access it. Uh, one other item to note is there is an existing six foot tall vinyl fence along the west property line, um, and that is intended to remain on the property after the it is developed. This is a look at the proposed landscape plan. As I mentioned earlier, this is compliant with the requirements of the land development code. They have exceeded in some aspects the um, size of plantings um, and as well as some of the materials and number of plantings. Um, specifically, I'll call out they're required to have a buffer screen between the residential property to the west and this uh, subject property. They do meet the buffer width, which is eight feet. They meet the number of tree plantings. I think there's 10, one, two, or nine trees along the buffer um, area, and they have a hedgerow proposed. Um, in addition, that existing six-foot vinyl fence, which is not required in our screening requirements, will remain and it will provide some additional screening between the two um, properties. Uh, one thing to note is uh, the trees that they are proposing to plant are larger than what we would typically require by the code at the time of planting. So according to the municipal arbor arborist, 
Um, at the time of planting, they will have a more sufficient screening right off the bat than they would typically by the code. Uh, these are the elevations provided by the applicant. The top elevation is looking at the north elevation. The bottom is the east elevation. That's what would face US 19. The top picture here is the south elevation. This is the drive-through side of the building. And then the bottom picture is the west elevation looking towards the back of the property. The land development code requires that a transportation management plan is provided for all proposed developments that would generate more than 50 new peak hour trips. This uh, project does generate that traffic amounts, uh, so the applicants did provide a transportation management plan. Uh, the purpose of those plans is to manage the impacts of the proposed project on transportation facilities and services, uh, provide options for increasing mobility for all different modes of transportation, and also to help reduce potentially single occupancy motor vehicle trips. Uh, we did have the transportation management plan reviewed by our, uh, by our staff certified transportation planner, and that was found to be sufficient to meet the standards of our code. Um, specifically, some of the aspects of the project that address the transportation impacts are, one, a single point of access, uh, specifically that it's a right-in, right-out only, it provides any sort of left-hand turn movements onto US-19. Um, it also has a large entry radii, so it's a smoother transition in and out of the site. <laughs> Uh, next, they, with the pedestrian connections that they're proposing, and it provides opportunities for people and adjacent properties to get to the site without getting into a motor vehicle. And then lastly, staff would recommend um, the addition of bicycle parking on site. So if the project is proposed, staff would recommend a condition approval that they add some um, bike racks on the property. These are the review criteria for a site plan. Number one is the consistency with the comprehensive plan. Uh, staff found that the application is consistent with the comprehensive plan, specifically the intent, allowed uses, and standards of the CG commercial general land use category. Uh, number two is consistency with the land development code. Again, staff found that the proposed project was com in compliance with the city's land development code, and it was outlined in the staff report some of the specific requirements that were um, accommodated on the project. Number three is the city's concurrency management system. Uh, the project can be served by existing city facilities and services. Uh, the proposed impacts are not expected to adversely affect the city's ability to serve this development as well as the community at large. And then further, the transportation management plan was reviewed by our certified transportation planner and found consistent to comply with the standards of the land development code. And lastly, the city's building codes, um, it is expected and required to meet all building codes. Uh, with that, staff does recommend approval of resolution number 2023-13 of the proposed site plan. We do have seven conditions on site, or I'm sorry, <laughs> with the approval recommendation. Uh, the first is that the construction plans are consistent with the site plan approval. The second, um, any details for site lighting and on-site signage uh, will be provided with the building permit to uh, verify compliance with our design standards in the code. The third is that the development must comply with any public art program if the project exceeds $1 million in construction cost. The fourth is the applicant shall provide a maintenance and SOP for chamber inspection and cleaning. This is regarding their underground vaults for stormwater. Um, this would be verified by the Public Works Department during the site construction permit, and that's just their maintenance plans. Uh, number five, the existing fence along the west property line shall remain to provide additional buffer between the subject property and the Tarpon Shores Mobile Home Park. In the event that the fence is damaged, it shall be replaced with a six-foot-tall opaque fence. Number six, a bicycle rack providing a minimum of two spaces shall be provided on site and will be verified with a site construction permit. And then lastly, they have um, one year to apply for building permit. Otherwise, the site plan approval will expire. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm um, always here to answer them. <laughs> First of all, that curb cut is uh, out to 19. Is that uh, already there, or, is, or the DOT, or they have to apply for DOT for a curb? They'd cut? have to get DOT approval, and that's all verified um, during the building permit stage. So no, there's not an existing curb cut. And and I don't see a, a diesel lane coming into there. That's something that the DOT would require. That's something that we could require on a site plan. So it typically would be through um, DOT uh, because it's their roadway and their jurisdiction. If they find that the, it warrants um, a deceleration lane or something of that nature, they would have to um, comply with those standards. Okay, could that be a, mm -hmm. could that be a condition? 
Um, probably for this application, a, a condition would be that, um, or a recommended condition that I would have is that they obtain all necessary Florida Department of Transportation permits for the drive access, and it's verified at building permits. So it just reinforces that that needs to provide at the permit stage. But we can't recommend a desell, right? I'll it's refer to our attorney, but I don't believe no, so. Um, technically, because it's not your road, you don't have jurisdiction to do that. Okay. If it were well, a city, wait, of, if it were a city of Tarpon, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say it a requirement. I said make it a recommendation. Um, the problem is that your recommendation is That's technically okay. to, yes, to FDOT, right, not okay. to the applicant. All right, well, okay. All right, gotcha. <laughs> okay. Um, the other, um, as far as the, the, the uh, vehicle impact study, there's like three or four coffee locations right there. So it's actually going to be vehicle neutral. <laughs> because you're not going to drive all 19 yeah. just to get a cup of coffee if there's yeah. there's a Dunkin' Donuts, there's AB Audio, whatever, they have a coffee shop there and there's a few others. So, you know. That was something that I, I meant to mention during that um, slide as well is in the transportation management plan, um, they also provided that they have pass-by capture and what that means is a lot of those new trips, the, trip, the new trips is basically a calculation and a manual of this type of use and the size of the use, and it generates that number based off of different models. Um, but they also talked about pass-by capture, which means a lot of their trips, a majority of them, is gonna really be generated from existing traffic that's already on US-19. Um, similar project is when I think KFC or Starbucks just came in recently, it's the same calculations. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Is there anything on the property now? I'm Looks like just trees, probably. Nope, I believe there's two trees on the property. <laughs> Any further questions for staff? May I uh, ask what kind of trees? That are currently on the site? No, they are proposed for the site. Do we there is a whole mixture of trees um, that are proposed. I believe they have some oaks. I want to say some crepe myrtles. There's, I think, six or seven different tree types. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you offering the city's file in this matter for the board's consideration tonight? Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. I, I, I do have a comment which has nothing to do with the application. Mm -hmm. when, when we get these things, I think they're very nice and everything, but a lot of this technical data, I'm just looking at ways to save paper but there's a lot of technical data here. And I, I don't think it's up, uh, we're in a position that, that could interpret the technical data. I think that's more for staff or engineering or whatever, but if y'all looked at, and this is for all my, my the board members here, it's a lot of technical data. And that's a lot of paper. Yes. And mm -hmm. it's mostly paper that, that I think we all are ignoring because we don't have the expertise to interpret it, unless somebody up here does. Um, but um, just thinking that through yeah. for, for future presentations. Yes, no, I don't disagree with you. <laughs> but we, we do want to include any sort of information that's provided by the applicant um, as a part of the backup material. Um, some projects, like a new development, has more technical information that is reviewed by staff, but it's just there for backup materials. It's entered into the record. Like the percolation tests, all that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Well, and it looks like you get to see at, what we get to see. <laughs> up, up at the front, we we get the plans mm -hmm. and the elevations and all that, and mm -hmm. then then a few pages back, we get the same documents again. Yeah. Yeah. So what we how we try to structure just for just general knowledge for our staff reports, how we try to structure them is, um, you know, we put a staff report together that basically is summarizing everything that's in the backup material and then at the end of our staff report we always have an attachments list so something that you might be interested in you probably look at that attachments list and then say okay well I want to look at the resolution that has the the site plan that just kind of gives you an outline of what's all included so maybe you can kind of sift through what you have interest in and what you don't um, we also do provide the staff presentations in there which kind of summarizes that information well in a much more condensed manner um, but I think we're always open to ways that we can condense it, but I think we have to include all the application materials. <laughs> yeah, the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, just, I appreciate. Yeah. The, 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 the. Yeah, I mean, the, what I would like to see is more maps, and I don't understand why we only get to see like one business, and then everything else is under the codes. 
because it makes it look like on this map that this is Tarpon Shores Inn is like so far away from MLK and it is not. <laughs> it, and I would like to see each business, especially because it's such a concern if this is going to be a drive-through coming off of here. And I almost just don't really think that that's accurate to scale. It just looks like the Tarpon Shores Inn and MLK are like miles away in this picture. And instead of all of this, I'd rather see even just a real picture of what is there, like a Google. I mean, with all the technology we have, we're still <laughs> like mm -hmm. maps that we don't really... We want to, I mean, why can't we see like an actual image so that we can actually visualize what it's going to look like? I feel like there's a lot that's almost hidden and taken away from our like decision making by not actually seeing, even though we live in the city, what it would actually look like. You know, when these, I mean, the numbers from a traffic study don't really matter when you can actually see the distance on an actual picture or a Google image. Yeah, we can um, definitely. We can read any traffic study. Anybody knows a traffic study. They're, you can find three people to say, yeah, it's going to be fine there. What I don't understand what's behind the blue. Is that, can you explain, are those the mobile homes? What, what is this that's, other place yeah, that they're that's all driving the, in? That's to the west of the property adjacent is the mobile home park property. So, they have to so go. this is zooming out. This is the site. This is zooming out in the aerial photography from GIS that we have. This is your zoning map. We always try to include your zoning map to show you what well, other properties in the area. Fine. But but yes, we can, you know, we can expand on certain aspects, but also, depending on certain type of application requests, is sometimes we in include more information or less information depending on what the application. This is for site plan approval, so it's a little more condensed. But I, I understand your your um, so, point but, here to understand the context a little bit more. But is that drive? What is it going through? Is it going through the mobile home park? The drive? No, no, no. So the those, those just parking spots. I just couldn't tell from. Yeah, the yeah. Um, so the drive access is on US 19. So over here. That blue line that you saw, all that was showing is that there's an, I was trying to highlight that there's an existing fence between the property lines, on the property line between here and here. Um, this, so on this side of the blue line, such property obviously, and then on this side is the mobile home park property. Okay. Yeah. I have a quick question, Ellie, if I could, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, and I'll probably pose the same question to the applicant, but in your professional opinion, the fact that there's one ingress and egress to this, and yes, it's flared considerably, uh, but you have people now making a turn to exit. Is there a reason, in your opinion, why there couldn't be an egress directly after the people pick up to the south side of the building and exit onto 19 and make a right from there, not yet have to integrate back into the traffic coming in, and, a, and it looks like a pedestrian crossing there also for that, that traffic lane. Is there a reason why they, they couldn't do that? So, so that's a really good question. Um, so in general, it's better to have less access points, especially going on to a major roadway like US-19. Mm -hmm. The fewer access points provides fewer potential conflicts between traffic on the road, traffic right. exiting, pedestrians. Um, we also have in our code different separation requirements between driveways. So um, in this particular case, they may have not been able to meet the separation to have a second driveway on that site. We also have a separation between um, driveways and adjacent sites, and we did verify that they had to have at least 30 feet from the edge of this pavement to the property line, so they do meet that separation. So there's a couple of factors that go into this, but it, um, you know, in my professional opinion, I think in this particular case, in this context, one drive access is, is a safer option, just um, to have less conflicts with um, and ongoing from traffic. from having dealt with them in the past, FDOT is extremely stingy mm -hmm. about giving out curb cuts. Mm -hmm. They would never allow a second curb cut on this property. Mm -hmm. It's too, way too narrow. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'll just point out too is, um, just for consideration, yes, the drive through lane does come back out and have to exit, but this drive aisle, we require a minimum of 24 feet in width. So it's a fairly wide, in some cases, it's wider than some two lane roads. Right. So there is some room. So if cars are coming in, there's room still for a car to exit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reason I brought it up is because people ha have developed a, uh, a habit of not keeping right as, of as, as often as possible, and their turns in are very yeah. wide, <laughs> like they're the only car, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm just worried about a, you know, yeah. a, a conflict of somebody exiting and somebody entering and not realizing that it was yeah. also an exit. So good, good answer. Thank you, buddy. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Mm. Any further questions for staff? Seeing none, uh, 
Does the, is the applicant present and like to speak? State your name and address and then your presentation. Malaya Storm, um, we just moved, so I'm trying to remember the address. Um, 5404 Cypress Center Boulevard, um, Tampa, Florida. And I have been sworn in. Um, I would just like to thank staff for their presentation and I would agree with their recommendation, but I'm here for any additional questions you may have. Um, in regards to the access, I would agree with her. Her point that FDOT um, is very stingy with their curb mm. cuts, um, but the access point is is 24 feet in the drive aisle, but it comes way larger than that once you get onto the actual roadway with radiuses of 35 feet. Um, we do have Florida drivers here, but I, I'm sure that that will provide them significant room to make a turning movement. Um, we also consider large truck routes <coughs> further off um, our loading, uh, so they're able to fit pretty large trucks, WB 57s, through this site as well. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Actually, I, I have one. Um, Black Rifle, is that is that a veteran-owned franchise? Because it, it's, mm -hmm. it's yes, a... Yes, sir. Okay. Is it a what franchise? Veterans. Veteran owned. Veteran owned yeah. Veteran -owned yeah. franchise. Yeah. This is somebody with a jacket. Yeah, familiar I, with it. I, I have one other question. Uh, it has to do with the design. I'm assuming in that bottom left hand corner is the point of ordering in the menu board? Yes, where you could see um, there's like a small square above that right. car. That's the menu. Yeah, they, they actually have numbers 27 and 28, I think, or 26. Right. Uh, my only question is the volume of the respondent. Uh, and the impact that may have if there's a mobile home or two kind of close. I'm not so worried about the hotel to the south that's kind of transient and usually it's a little more commercially built, but mobile homes by right are thinner uh, and usually they're denser, closer together and, and closer to the lot lines. Is there any way to limit the responding volume when the order is given? Obviously we can't control the public. If they want to shout, they want to shout uh, or, or some sort of buffering to, uh, to minimize that for the, for the mobile home people? Yes, most definitely. We can take that into consideration, um, and that does take into consideration when we separate uh, that ordering point from a home. Um, so you can see it's not um, on that back side of the drive aisle, which is directly adjacent to a mobile home, right. as you can see. Um, we kind of slid it down on the site so it's more closer to the hotel use than it is to those mobile homes. We also have the fencing and the landscaping, which helps significantly. Right. But I can definitely um, speak with a client about options to um, reduce that volume and ordering. And I would state too um, that black rifles typically have uh, shorter um, operation hours than you would say like a Starbucks does where they're open much later at night and also way earlier in the morning. So Yeah, just, just something I've seen uh, subject to complaints on, on previous commercial sure. applications yes. for this type of you know drive through and ordering when there is a residential component uh, close like that. And just monitoring would probably suffice you know that uh, some of us are, are a little hard of hearing but most of us aren't so yeah. <laughs> just to just to test it out maybe monthly or something like that but thank you yeah. is that car wash still there there was a car wash there was a is it in north yeah, i i will say wash. that car wash is really noisy <laughs> so, <laughs> but nothing to do with you but i was curious whether it was still there isn't that right up and i haven't been there lately but isn't that right up next to the one north, the car sales? One that the is actual where, the, where, the gar, where the garage is. Is oh, that, that, okay. that what you're talking about? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's a standalone little car wash. Oh, yeah. I think it is. It's yeah. kind of a little rinky dink car yeah. wash. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. still there. I know that's noisy. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Those car washes get very noisy for sure. Thank you. I, I, I do know that it's a veteran owned business, but other than that, can you tell us a little bit more about? about it? I mean, they sell, you guys sell food. How is it different than a Starbucks or? Yes, yeah, so they have um, like limited food sales and stuff. Um, but the biggest thing that I've seen is the difference is only 40% of their um, customer base actually comes through the drive through which all of you know is way different than a Starbucks, which most all of their customer base um, comes through the drive through So they have a lot of people that sit in and work out of their uh, coffee shops. And it's more of like a cafe field that allows for the indoor and outdoor seating. So it's more of a, a destination coffee than, than the quick drive-through Starbucks. Is the outdoor seating going to be covered or just open? 
Um, they have a little bit of a cover over the top of them, um, but it's not like a structural foundation to cover over it, but they do have um, like an offset from the building that, that hangs over that. Yeah, like you can see on, on those, they have hang, hanging areas over the door. All right, any other questions for the applicant? Seeing none, are there members of the public here wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll close public comments. Uh, does staff have any rebuttal or closing comments? No. And the applicant rebuttal closing comments? All right, that brings it back to the board for consideration. I need a motion and a second and then we can discuss. A uh, motion to approve application 22-85 um, with regard to approval of the site plan. Um, with the seven subject with the, conditions. With the, with the, uh, with the city's uh, uh, conditional conditions as cited. Thank you. And I would second that. Is there further board discussion before we vote? Seeing none, let's have a roll call. Miss Early? Yes. Mr. Rocklin? Yes. Miss Frontis? No. Mr. Kuskudis? Yes. And Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right. That brings us to item number nine, staff comments. Uh, does the staff have, have comments? If this is where you want to do my presentation, we can do that now. Yeah, okay. that's fine. So everybody should have at your place um, one of these government in the sunshine handouts. Um, it looks kind of similar to the one that I provided on the quasi-judicial, right? So the first thing I have on there that I always like to put in these presentations um, is the oath of office for public officials. Um, if I ever have a conversation with you and I hand you your oath of office, it's probably not gonna be a good conversation. Um, so that's just sort of like a forewarning there. <laughs> um, but I like to provide that because it kind of reminds um, us as public officials what we are actually doing here and what our responsibility is to the public because we do have a responsibility to the public. You're here to uphold the Constitution, you're here to uphold the city charter, and the code of ordinances that are put in place by uh, the Board of Commissioners. So moving on, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit here about what government in the sunshine means. Um, and really what it is, is a mechanism to provide public access to the governmental decision-making process. And it promotes transparency, and ultimately the purpose of this is to pre prevent corruption in government, because you know, you as um, public officials do answer to the constituency of the city um, and they do have rights under the Florida Constitution to know what decisions you're making, how you're making those decisions, um, and the Sunshine Law um, is contained both in the Florida Constitution and then is enacted by the legislature under 286.011 Florida statutes. There's three basic requirements for the Sunshine Law. First is that the meetings must be open to the public. Two, there must be reasonable notice of such meetings. And three, minutes must be taken at all such meetings. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what each one of those requirements means. But first, I wanna talk about what actually constitutes a meeting. Because a lot of people think that a meeting is like this sort of scenario where you know we're here on the dais, we're talking, we're all together. Um, but a meeting um, for the purposes of Sunshine Law is any formal or informal gathering of just two of you or more. So that can be in person, that can be on the phone, that can be via the internet. All of those constitute meetings under the Sunshine Law. And there's extensive case law and opinions from the Attorney General's office that talk about that and go through different scenarios um, that have kind of developed since uh, the, even just the current Constitution was put in place. But um, so 
those conversations, it's not that you cannot be around your other board members, but what you cannot do is discuss matters that may come before you in your official capacity as a board member here. So those are, the, those are ultimately the discussions that are prohibited. Um, and I would also emphasize too that it is people of the same board. So you are only bound by that for the people that are on this board. You can talk to the Board of Commissioners, however, because your decisions are quasi-judicial, if you do talk to the Board of Commissioners about decisions you make here or cases that come up, um, ultimately what that does is then cause that commissioner to have to make a um, de declaration when this matter comes before them that they had ex parte communications. So for that reason, on this particular board, um, it's probably better if you don't talk about the cases that you hear um, to sitting commissioners that are then going to have to make that disclosure on the record. Um, also to a writing, um, and a lot of times this has been presented in the past as a position paper, and they have something that's referred to sort of as the one bite at the apple, I guess, <laughs> one bite at the apple rule, right? And that means that, let's say there's something coming up and um, you wanted for whatever reason to make your, you know, your position known on this to your fellow board members, so you put together a memorandum and then email it out to all the, the um, commission, right? First of all, again, because you know you are predominantly a quasi-judicial board, you're putting, you know, the, there could be an issue there with putting that position out. But if you're just doing it based on like legislative action, um, you can do that. It's not a direct violation. Where the violation then comes in is if there's discourse. Mm -hmm. So um, if one of you puts something out there and then somebody else starts commenting on it, like on Facebook or on a message board or something like that that's where you're going to get into the sunshine law violation because that's creating discourse outside of the public meeting on a matter that's subject to your, um, your ultimate decision, right? Also, telephone conversations, text messages, all of those can be grounds or basis to have a sunshine law violation. Um, any type of communication, it doesn't really matter what it is, can constitute a meeting for the purposes of sunshine law and then become a sunshine law violation. So um, when we talk about open to the public, there's a couple different things that the, that the attorney general's office looks at and that um, you know a court would look at in, ter in terms of determining whether or not there is a sunshine law um, issue, and that is whether or not your facilities are adequate, right? So if you know, you guys have a huge room in here, so I can't really see a scenario where you're gonna have to move from, from somewhere this because you're anticipating that much of a crowd, right? Um, occasionally, actually, I think the Board of Commissioners, uh, Board of County Commissioners Chamber is a little bit smaller, and I can remember times when I was sitting on the county LPA where they had to move our meetings to different locations, like the St. Mm -hmm. Pete Epicenter or like the Largo Public Library, in order to accom accommodate the anticipated crowds that were going to attend. Um, so I don't really think you have to worry about that. Um, but open to the public, this is where they come down on the um, audible discussions. Um, and that has been something that I've seen in multiple jurisdictions as of late where um, board members are trying to look at something or make a decision and they're talking to each other um, either away from the microphone or in a manner where the public can't hear what they're discussing. Well, that kind of vi that is a violation and kind of goes directly against the purpose of the Sunshine Law, where it's to have those open discourses so mm -hmm. that the public that's attending can hear, so that you can adequately get it recorded on your video and audio if you're doing that. I will say that video and audio recording are not a Sunshine Law requirement, but it has become the predominant practice of most local governments these days. Um, also, too, uh, the public has the right to be heard. Um, and that is something that wasn't always explicitly stated in the Sunshine Law. It was actually an amendment to the statute in 2011 that did require um, public comment for any meeting where there was going to be a, an official decision of the, the body or the board that was make, the uh, decision maker. Um, the next slide, these really aren't applicable to you, but these are some examples of sunshine law exemptions. One of the big ones is shade meetings when you get into litigation. And the statute is actually very specific about some of the things that need to, fo to be followed if you're doing shade meetings. Um, but those are gonna be something that only occur at the, the commission level and um, not for your board. 
So that takes us then into public records laws. So public records are also um, part of the state constitution um, and they are extensive regulations that have been put into place by the reg uh, legislature in chapter 119 Florida statutes. You have um, on the bottom of page five, slides nine and 10, um, you have here the actual definition from a state statute of what a public record is. Um, but then on the next page, I kind of break it down um, on how they put it in case law, which is a lot more digestible. Um, and it's what I like to emphasize here is that it's any material. So it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's a video. It doesn't matter if it's a phone message. It doesn't matter if it's an audio recording. It is any material um, in, in connection with official agency business, so the official business of your board that is intended to perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge, right? So that includes social media, blogs, message boards, it doesn't matter. If you're posting things that are specific to your relationship to the city and your role as a board member, all of that will constitute a public record and you are charged as the custodian of that record with preserving it in the manner that's provided um, by state law, right? Um, and basically in order to, there's actually procedures that have to be followed um, when you are destroying a public record. And there's a retention schedule that talks about the nature of the record and then how long you're required by law to keep that record. Um, and then when you do dispose of it, there is a reporting requirement um, that then uh, you have to report the destruction of that record and, the, and to uh, the Department of State. So that's kind of how public records work. A lot of times that gets um, overlooked, particularly um, with social media. Um, usually best practices, if you are going to be posting things with respect to your official business with the city, um, to retain that in some manner. And then if you ever do leave office, then to give that to the city clerk so the city then does have that record and they can preserve it um, in the manner provided by law. Also providing those records to the city clerk um, helps them do their job so when they do get public records requests they have a mechanism then to go back and check and make sure that they're getting adequately um, all of the records that pertain to the records requests that they are receiving. Um, so next, um, I'm gonna get into a little bit of Florida, Florida's ethics laws. So um, I have there, uh, the a public office is a public trust. So um, I like to always emphasize that. That is sort of like the, the slogan or the moniker that you'll see for the Florida Commission on Ethics. A public office is a public trust. I did uh, last year publish an article with Stetson's Law Review that talks all about recent changes that were made to the state constitution for both lobbying and abuse of power. And I'm gonna go over those um, in a little bit. But sort of the purpose of this is to make sure that there are honest services and honest services provided to the public by public servants, right? And so when you look at state ethics laws, it talks about the things that you can do and you can't do um, in terms of both your private interactions and then also with respect to your roles in the city. Um, so the first one that I'm going to talk about is what recently um, went into effect, which was the 2018 Constitutional Amendments, Amendment 12 specifically. Um, and this one um, was passed by 78.6% of Florida voters. That is an insane amount. That's over 6 million Florida voters that approved Amendment 12 in 2018. It was put forward. Um, during the Constitutional Revision Commission that specifically deals with abuse of public office, right? Um, and the basically what it does is it follows the um, statutory language uh, for a misuse of official position that has been in, in place for decades. Um, and it is a little bit more specific, the constitutional provision, which is usually more general. In this case, it's the opposite the statutory provision, the statutory violation is a lot more general and the constitutional provision is a lot more strict. That's because the, the penalties for violating um, the constitutional provision are gonna be a lot more hefty and, they're, and requires a little bit more stringent intent, right? Um, so one of the things that they did that the uh, legislation did is it said to the Commission on Ethics, you have to give us an outline of what it means to have a disproportionate benefit. And 
basically when you have abuse of um, public position, what it says is that you cannot receive and nobody that is related to you either um, in terms of a family member, right? And then also anybody that has a business relationship to you cannot receive a disproportionate benefit because of a decision you're making by virtue of your public office, right? So you can't use your public office to benefit yourself, to benefit your family, or to benefit family members. Um, and what the Commission on Ethics put in place is contained in the Florida Administrative Code, and I have the six factors there that they look at to determine whether or not something constitutes a disproportionate benefit. Um, it talks about the number of those who benefit, their connection to the public official, the nature of the benefit, um, the degree of the benefit, um, and the certainty of the outcome. Yes? Question. And I think, uh, I don't know about everybody <clears throat> else, I think this frenzy may have the same situation well, there's a lot of family in this town <laughs> right <laughs> correct me if i'm wrong I, i've noticed there's a lot of family <laughs> in, in the town. and it you know it may not it could be likely that mm -hmm. a family member may be up here for something right okay um does the do the does do the uh, ethics require us to to uh basically step aside on cases like that? Yes, so that is actually one of the situations where you would have to file a voting conflict of interest. And when and um, I do have another slide on that, but I'll talk about it now since it, it kind of came up. So when you have a voting conflict of interest, it looks at whether or not it, in, it the decision you're making in yours to your private benefit or the private benefit of your specific family members. And how family is defined, That's it actually correct. is very specifically defined, and it's defined differently, right, for different violations of the state ethics laws. Mm. So it's defined differently for um, nepotism laws. It's defined differently for voting conflicts, which makes it all the more important if you know you have a family member that is involved in an application or has an application coming before, um, that you get with me to make sure that it's not in one of the prohibited classifications because it's not always in-laws, but then sometimes it's in-laws. <laughs> and so you have to kind of look at some of those connections um, that are specific to the situation that's arising. Um, um, so under the ethics laws, I break them into four categories, right? And I'm on the bottom of page eight, slide 16. Um, and I broke them into prohibited conduct, voting conflicts, uh, prohibited business and employment practices, um, and then basically financial disclosure issues. So under prohibited conduct then on the next page we have these different categories. You have solicitation or acceptance of gifts or honoraria, unauthorized con uh, compensation, the misuse of public position that we kind of talked uh, about, and um, disclosure or use of certain information that you receive only by, by virtue of your status as a board member. All right. Um, with the gifts, you can never accept anything that is being given to you with the intent to influence your decision, regardless of the value. If you know that what you're receiving is sort of like a quid pro quo, um, then you cannot accept it. Um, if it's under $25, then it's usually fine. You don't have to do anything. Anything over $100 absolutely has to be reported, and there's a specific reporting form that has to be filed, um, filled out and filed. Um, the misuse of, of um, public position, I talked about how it's very specific under the state constitution. The way it's defined in Florida statute, um, it is whether or not it, you or others. If you are receiving a disproportionate benefit or giving a disproportionate benefit to others um, by virtue of your public position, that would constitute misuse of public position. Um, the next one down here, prohibited employment and business practices, the dual office holding. So the dual office holding is important. The threshold issue that you always have to look at for dual office holding is whether or not it actually constitutes an office. Um, and because you all uh, predominantly do uh, recommendations, uh, there have been opinions from the Attorney General's office that say that this does not constitute an office for the purpose of the dual office holding prohibition in the Constitution because you are not a final decision-making body. Um, then doing, obviously doing business with one's own agency, you can't do business with the city while you're, you're holding um, 
a position on this board. Uh, also, you cannot have a conflicting employment relationship, so people who work in the city can't also sit on boards because there's too much of a potential for conflict there. Um, and also, anti-nepotism, you all really don't do any hiring, you don't do any appointments, so you don't really have to worry about that on this board. Um, here's the voting conflicts, um, the disclosure form. Also, too, um, one, you, ha you have, there's specific time periods. I think it's 15 days after um, the actual thing. You, you are required within that time period to, to fill out your, your voting um, form that says you're not voting and to turn it into the clerk and then that has to be attached to the minutes of the subsequent meeting right that says you declared this voting conflict why you declared it that's all part of the form that has to be filled out um, and that form is available on the Commission on Ethics website um, you do have as public officials the ability to request opinions from the Ethics Commission um, I would always highly recommend that you consult um, with me prior to doing that because once you do it and then you get a request uh, decision from the Ethics Commission, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's binding on everybody statewide, just not you. Um, and then filing an ethics complaint, anyone can file an ethics for, um, complaint, any individual, it has to be sworn to. Um, it is required to be notarized, um, and then they kind of go through the process of investigating whether or not it constitutes probable cause. So um, the penalties adopted I have down here, these are just the penalties for um, violation of the ethics code, right? So it can involve impeachment, removal from office, suspension from office, public censure and reprimand, um, forfeiture. Um, and a civil penalty not to exceed $10,000. There have been movements in the um, legislature over the past, I wanna say 10 to 20 years to increase that from 10,000 to $100,000 uh, because there certainly are certain instances, particularly in the state legislature where $10,000 just really isn't a deterrent. Um, and then also restitution of any pecuniary benefits. So if you ever do anything that does result in any sort of financial windfall, um, there can be a scenario where you do have to repay that money, um, particularly if it was money that was um, due, or, due or owed to the city. Um, then I have here the penalties for violation of Sunshine Law. Um, it is a second degree misdemeanor up to 60 days in jail and or a $500 fine. Um, it is pursued by the state attorney's office and what it does ultimately is it invalidates any action that you took. So if there is a finding that Sunshine Law was validated, in, that Sunshine Law was violated, um, whatever decision you made, whether it was a legislative decision or a quasi-judicial decision, it will automatically invalidate that decision. Um, then for public records laws, um, you know, again, a $500 fine. Um, it can re result in uh, suspension, removal, or impeachment, <coughs> and it is a first-degree misdemeanor. So one of the things I also kind of talk about is other um, criminal acts um, that can arise. Um, some of these are actually kind of rare. You don't see them enforced a lot, and um, a lot of that has to do with the intent requirements, right? So lawyers know that there's a different criminal intent, and you'll see some areas where these particular provisions actually overlap with the ethics provisions, and a lot of that, whether it's pursu per, uh, pursued as a criminal violation under one of these statutes, or under the ethics code. The ethics code tends to be more civil, uh, uh, civil action in nature and more administrative versus some of these other criminal acts when you talk about things like bribery, right? Um, so this first one is false official statements. Um, this is, is anyone, right? So this doesn't have to be staff. This doesn't have to be um, somebody in connection with the city. It is really actually anyone who presents false statements in writing with the intent to mislead a public servant in the performance of his or her duties. You actually see this a lot of times um, utilized more so with like false reports to police officers and stuff like that, um, but it is quali a qualifying um, misdemeanor for somebody to represent something in writing to your board intentionally um, with, with the intent that they deceive or defraud a, a public officer or public servant. 
So this next section, I have sort of the, the uh, definitions, or actually, I know they're very tiny there. Some of the ones I highlighted are what a benefit actually means, what harm means. It's a pecuniary or other loss uh, constitutes a harm, right? And then there's um, a, what constitutes a public servant and a public, contract, a public contractor. Um, then we have the official uh, misconduct. This here uh, would be the destruction of public records. A destruction of public records would fall under official m misconduct. So that can be pursued um, criminally if it's severe enough. It's, if it's a severe enough violation, um, that is an option that they have. Typically, you see that more with folks in-house who falsify or in some other manner um, obstruct access to public documents or destroy public documents that have public value. So that's a pretty big violation there under official misconduct. Um, then here we have these, this is all one section on page 15 that had to break up onto two slides. And this is basically your bribery statute, you know, your quid pro quo for um, unlawful compensation or reward for official behavior. Also, it is a very specific crime for anyone to threaten a public servant. So to the extent if anybody were ever to threaten um, a member of this board to make a decision in one way or another or threaten to harm, again, that can include um, a pecuniary loss or loss of business or some other item, right? That is actually a very specific crime that can be committed against public officials. Um, also, too, so we have that other one where I talked about if you have special or specific information, um, the disclosure or use of confidential information or criminal justice information, again, that's not really something that's going to apply to your board. That's more um, sort of the Board of Commissioners. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions about this, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, if you don't want to ask me now, my contact information is there, and uh, you can email me or call me with any additional questions. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be getting this tonight, right? Uh, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> just checking. I just had, I had one question because I shared the agenda today. Is that just the page, like the first page, just to like tell people? I didn't know if that just so what was on the agenda. Is that okay to share? Right. So um, when you do that, right, then you're creating a public record. Okay. Um, so it's just important for you to preserve that, okay. and then if people comment on that, you are supposed to be saving those comments okay. right? mm -hmm. yes so those are all supposed to be preserved as part of the public record as part of you know official business you, right. you know you are a board member right. now if, if you were posting the board of commissioners agenda that's mm -hmm. a little bit different yeah you're not on the board of commissioners right. but you are on this board and that was the first time i did it because the the mayor does it all the time so yeah. that's why i was like well it's good to know that because people are not aware of these meetings all the time well yeah no that's 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 fine yeah. and you can do it but then you just need to preserve that okay. actually thanks for i i do i do have a question uh-huh and and you know and i'll give you the the circumstance that maybe uh you know when we had uh that cohatch coming in front of us mm -hmm. um you know i reached out to some of the business owners just to, to basically to let them know that that's coming to, for us to look at and it's important that you show up at a zoning meeting to express mm -hmm. your opinions now obviously that's a conversation with regard to something on the agenda uh -huh. um but and i want to address that later when we go to mm -hmm. staff i mean uh, 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 board comments but that in and of itself would not be a violation or something. So it's it's not a violation, but you have created an additional public record. I'm just looking at my pocket. Okay. Right. It's not a sunshine violation because it's right. to business owners, yeah. and you're not telling them how you're going to vote on something. You know, you're passing on information, but it is information relative to your role as a board member here. Mm -hmm. And what if you were, in, in that same scenario, if you were garnering their opinion? So if you were garnering their opinion, then that's an ex parte communication that requires disclosure. Okay. Regardless of whether they show up or not? Correct. Okay. Got yeah. It. Okay. So, like, next time if I shared the agenda, should I, s I mean, because I have, there's business owners on my page, right? So like, I would turn I, the comments, the way, like, I would I, turn the comments off, quite frankly. Oh, okay. Because mm. then you don't have to worry yeah, about worry preserving, about you don't have to worry oh. about preserving what shows up there. Okay. 
Thanks. <laughs> Makes it a lot easier. <laughs> thank you for this. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. You're very thank welcome. You. That's very helpful. It is. Yeah. It's not in the original um, training, that part of like that. Probably not. <laughs> All right, uh, item 10, board comments. Do board members wish to I, comment? I, I do, and I actually had mentioned this when I first walked in. Um, and this is actually not just, this is not for the board, this is for if anybody out there is listening. Um, um, you know, that, that we had that, and let's go back to that cohatch again, because it's been in the paper, and it's been a little bit of controversial. And the, you know, it, it goes back to that apartment complex when, when we had a whole bunch of people here that, that were objecting to the development. And as a board, we voiced our uh, vote. And I, I can't remember if it was 6-1 or 7-1, whatever. But to some degree, the Board of Commissioners at that point in time completely ignored our recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay, even to send it back because they provided additional information at the commission meeting mm. and that's why the commission now has elected when, when things are different to, to send it back in front of us and the last commission meeting that particular issue with Kohatch came in front of the commission and there was a, a, a quite a big uh, vocalized opposition to to the applicant and we, we actually heard it twice, if I remember correctly here. And, and the concern was, whatever the concern was, they came, we, we basically denied it the first time, we approved it the second time. And there was, I would call it apathy, that there was not, except for the second time, there was, I think, one person here who had a downtown business, and that's why I asked you about mm -hmm. if it was, because I had called a couple of the businesses and said, look, if you're concerned about this application, mm -hmm. you should show up at a zoning meeting because as far as I'm concerned, if you don't show up, if you're apathetic about it, you know, that, that it, it's, it's, it puts the onus on us to make their value decisions or their objections. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, I think absent a compelling reason, mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons we have this zoning board is to give recommendations to the commissioners, mm -hmm. and that the commissioners should, absent a compelling reason, should hopefully follow our recommendations, because that's why we're here for. Otherwise, we should not even exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, if, 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 if we're ignored in our recommendations consistently, or again, absent a compelling reason. And so the message is to, if anybody's out there looking or listening, if you've got an issue with something going on in this community that's in front of the zoning board, it's incumbent upon you to come and express your concerns because there are issues that we uh, could address as far as recommendations. For example, you know, was there a, is there a loading dock in the back? I don't know, we proved it and that was not, I don't think that was a requirement, but it could have been somebody said, look, how are trucks gonna get there and deliver? These are things that as residents, especially business owners that are affected, again, come express your thoughts because it, it helps us when we come to the decision making process. And I appreciate the opportunity to say that. Thank you. And, Thank you. and building on that, uh, when, when we do look at making further recommendations to the BOC uh, regarding things in the ordinance that, that we'd like to take a new look at or we'd like them to take a new look at, uh, the notice part of our ordinance is something that I think we definitely need to look at because I, I know we complied with the notice requirements in that case, but I would say that those notice requirements could have uh, certainly been stronger and we probably would have had more people here like you're talking about because mm -hmm. there was, because of the nature of the project, notice wasn't, but really public notice wasn't required to speak of and on something that affects as many people as that does, somehow 
in the future, we should look for a way to make sure that those things are noticed. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree 100% with, with Merle. And a, a, a lot of that, I think, has been recognized by residents and the business owners that, that they do need to take more responsibility and seeing what's on the agenda. But, and I think that they're understanding that, but at the same time, you know, the, the Board of Commissioners is elected and we're appointed by them. The staff, I mean, I, I don't think since I've been on here has yet to not approve something. And when they haven't approved it, they don't, they just don't say they don't approve it. So one of the requirements of being on the board, any of these boards, is that you be a resident of Tarpon. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that that's a requirement for any st city staff. Uh, positions do require so, residency. Yeah, there are a couple it, per the charter. Is uh, it in our city? In your city. Okay. Yeah, that they are required to be residents. But I think that part of, even though we're not elected, we are appointed. And, you know, we, we, we live in the city. We, I'm not saying that we are chosen to represent them, but at the same time, we should be putting the residents and the business owners into our consideration. So we can't just say, well, you didn't show up because we need to be thinking of the current climate and those people's needs and their their needs first not just the applicant and i think that that's uh, granted they should be here but i mean as you could tell from the the meetings afterwards i mean had they known they would have well it's all it also too would be important because the staff does receive comments ahead of time and i know just from my experience so far with the city when they do receive an email a letter whatever it is they let you know so even if they can't physically be here at the meetings, they still have that opportunity to have their voice heard, you know, um, by submitting something in writing that says why they do or do not support or or. Um, well, and I think something. a lot of that too is um, a lot of now after that, since business owners are reaching out to individual commissioners and things like that. Um, and I really was hoping Renee or Pat was going to be here tonight because I wanted to discuss you know, the parking analysis and what we can do as the planning and zoning board, because I've had at least four business owners come up, not, not with a specific project or anything on the agenda, but just to, to discuss parking. Right. And from the communications that I've seen that are all public record between various commissioners and the and downtown residents, it's still unclear to me what, other than what our city has done, like if we've not requested an expert or some kind of, I mean, I know that we bid a lot of these things out, but I don't think that there has been an official parking analysis done by an outside company. And how can we, as the planning and zoning board, because it comes up and, mm -hmm. and things that come to us, can, how can we help facilitate that to get that done? Um, so I can sense your issue because technically you as a board don't have the ability to direct staff, right. only the board of commissioners can do that. So again, you're in the position where you have to say, hey, we think that this is important for you to look at. We know it's been an issue. Please direct staff to secure this or to do right. this. So that's that's really the best recourse you have for something like that. Um, the other place too is you also too are the body pursuant to, to chapter 163 that uh, makes recommendations regarding the comprehensive plan and looking at the transportation elements and things like there things that are contained in there to make sure that what you're doing is consistent, that's another mechanism where you can kind of push that issue because the policies, goals, and objectives, even for something you know like parking, um, can sometimes be reiterated in documents like that that establish those goals for the city. Okay, because I know last time there was a motion made, I think, for one of those amendments, um, because I think right now, between all those business, it seems like no one knows who's Court, whose ball? I mean, whose court the ball is in right now? Right. Like we're waiting for your input, or we did an analysis, and it's just kind of. It's it's my understanding, and I'm not sure exactly where they are in the process, but that they're 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 bidding the professional services mm -hmm. contract to hire a traffic consultant to do the the parking study for the area, right. but maybe Allie can I tell us more about, about the status yes. of that. Yeah, there was direction from the board of commissioners and the city manager to pursue basically a parking study that hasn't been done for downtown. Now there's been a lot of development over the past several years since the redevelopment area was established to do that study to determine um, if there is a deficiency in parking, looking ahead at 
future development and parking um, potential conflicts. So yes, that is something that we are actively putting together a request for proposals or qualifications to put out to firms to bid on to, to do that work. So we'll have an analysis. So that's in the works right now. Mm -hmm. I don't have a time frame, unfortunately, of so when that will be. But within the, next, well, within the next couple of months, the, the request for proposals will go out. So would it be fair to ask at, each, at the next meeting where we are at that stage? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Any other board comments? Well, just that I, I, I already discussed with the mayor uh, about the parking conditions and the fact that he and the board itself maybe need to broadcast that a little more because it seemed a lot of people were not aware that they were in the process of developing uh, an RFP for this parking study. Uh, and I believe the mayor said it was 22 or 23 years since the last one was done. So they are, they are moving forward, which is good to know. The other thing I mentioned to him was, and this came up in, in a couple of hearings, uh, past one with, with this board uh, and the board of commissioners was a multiple dwelling adjacent to a project that the property owner was notified, but not the residents. So it's always been my suggestion over the, the, the past decades to send a notification to the occupant, current occupant slash business owner, in addition to the property owner. And you know, it can wind up to be a lot more postage, obviously, but the transparency is worth its weight in gold. So uh, that would be my recommendation going forward is to notify whether or not it needs to be you know, uh, registered mail or, or something of that nature, I'll leave that up to them, but at least notify the physical addressee on top of the landlord. Uh, sometimes how that's accomplished if it's because um, you can kind of run into the same thing with condominiums mm -hmm. so it's kind of the same scenario where they'll send it to like the association but not to all the people that actually live in the building right, right? Um, one of the ways that that you can kind of address that is is the posting of the property like a lot of times you see like those big billboards that will mm -hmm. talk about you know there's going to be a public meeting and right. all of that sometimes those are very helpful too um, and I don't know when you you all do posting versus direct mail. Yeah, so there's different, in our land development code and codes that we have, there are different public noticing requirements based on application type. Some applications don't require posting the property, some do. Some do. Um, that's something that we're looking at potentially Putting signs on it for, like, for for instance, conditional uses don't require you us to post the property, but that's potentially something that we can look at changing the code to post on that property. So, people that don't necessarily get noticed by the legal advertisements that go into the paper, um, to the you know physical mail notice, they still also potentially could see something's happening based off seeing a sign. So there's different methods to reach out to them. So that's something that we're we're looking at and that's been discussed. And I think that was also something that the commission had us um, and Renee looking at. All right, if there's no further board comments, we stand adjourned. Thank you.